Listening test two. You'll hear a number of different recordings, and you'll have to answer the questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you'll be given ten minutes to transfer all your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. Listen to the conversation between Fred and Mary, who are talking about a farewell party, and answer questions one to four. Now look at questions one to four. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first and repeated. Mary, thank God you're here. We've a ton of work to do if we're going to get everything ready for tonight. Whose idea was it to have this going away party for Christ anyway? It was your idea, Fred. Remember? Hey, I suggested a small get together for a few close friends. I didn't mean inviting half the university. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Mary, thank God you're here. We've a ton of work to do if we're going to get everything ready for tonight. Whose idea was it to have this going away party for Christ anyway? It was your idea, Fred. Remember? Hey, I suggested a small get together for a few close friends. I didn't mean inviting half the university. Well, it's too late now. We have about three hours to get everything under control. Have you got that list of things we need to do? Yeah, it's in my room. Hang on, I'll go get it. Yeah, well, I can't find it. What do you mean you can't find it? I can't find it. What do you think I mean? Damn, I remember I left it in the library. Okay, okay, cool down. We'll manage. I can remember what's on it. Let's check the food and drink situation. Did you arrange the beer? Yeah, Jim said he'd bring ten cases of cold Budweiser, ice, and a couple of big bins to keep it cold. Says he'll get here around five. Ah,、oh, you know Jim. He'll probably turn up drunk around midnight. No problem. I phoned him a few minutes ago. He's at Jenny's place. She's keeping him away from alcohol until he's delivered everything safe and sound. What about the wine? You said you'd look after it. Oh my God! I completely forgot. What's the time? Half past three. Okay, I'll go to the liquor store and sort it out. Will they deliver? No problem, but you'll have to pay up front. I reckon about sixty people will turn up. Allow for half a bottle per person. That makes thirty bottles, half red, half white. What do you think? Nah, that should be enough. Better to have too much than too little. Why not make it forty? Twenty-five red and fifteen white. As the conversation continues, answer questions five to ten. Yeah, I guess most people prefer red. Where's the nearest liquor store? Not far. Go out the front door, turn right. Sorry, left. Take the second street on your right, and it's three hundred yards down on the left, just before you get to the park. Okay, I'll go in a few minutes. Let's first make a quick list to make sure we haven't forgotten anything. Glasses, glasses. What about glasses? Sally borrowed a hundred beer glasses and a hundred wine glasses from the student bar. They're in the cupboard. Should be enough. Yeah, should be. What about the barbecue? I've got two barbecues and plenty of charcoal out the back. 
and Jane and I spent three hours yesterday getting the steaks, chicken legs, and sausages ready. They're all in the big fridge. Should taste terrific. Tons of garlic, pepper, and soy sauce. No MSG. Sounds good. What about plates and things? Sally has looked after that as well. She's borrowed them from the bar too. They're in the cupboard with the glasses. You know, Sally refuses to use throwaway things. Bad for the environment. Good for her. Oh, just remembered. Could you pick up another twenty loaves of French bread and a few packets of paper napkins? No problem. Is there a shop on the way? There's a supermarket just before you get to the liquor store. Can you manage everything, or should I go with you? I'll manage. I've got this huge rucksack. No problem. Damn! Just remembered. I'm over my limit on my credit card. Have you got five hundred dollars on you? We'll work out who owes who how much later. No problem. I took out a thousand dollars this morning. Here's five hundred. Ta. Okay, I'll get going. I'll see you in a while. Ciao. See you. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear a talk by Richard Thomas, who is the head of the chemistry department of a college. He is going to give a brief introduction of the college, and you must answer questions according to what you hear. Now, first look at questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Royal Hospital College. What a beautiful September day you've brought with you! My name is Richard Thomas. I'm the head of the chemistry department, and today it's my pleasure to introduce our wonderful college to you. Normally, the dean, Professor John Thomas, yes, we share the same surname, likes to do this, but unfortunately, he has a bad case of flu. So he is doing the sensible thing and staying in bed. He sends his apologies, but you'll be meeting him soon, so no big problem. I'm sure you are all so excited at the thought of studying here that you have read all about the history of our school. But for those who haven't, I'll give you a brief summary as we walk around. The college was originally founded in anybody know? Yes. Sixteen ninety four by William and Mary of Orange. Can you remember your high school history? Right, William of Orange was a Dutch prince married to King James the Second's eldest daughter Mary. Sixteen ninety four. Poor Queen Mary died of smallpox the same year. Actually, the school was not a school in those days. It was a hospital for retired sailors of the Royal Navy. And it wasn't here in the beautiful countryside of East England. It was located in what is now East London on the banks of the River Thames. Back in those days, it was also in the countryside. But London grew and grew, and by the end of the nineteenth century, it was surrounded by houses and smoky factories. So, after the Second World War, a New Zealand millionaire named Sir Gifford Reid. Kindly gave the school sixty-five million pounds to move to here. He was an architect, and he designed much of the beautiful school that you see today. It opened in nineteen sixty-three, and if you look to your right, there is a statue of Sir Gifford Reid facing that other large statue of Queen Victoria. As the talk is going on, answer the questions sixteen to twenty.
Okay, let's jump back to the 1700s. In the 1780s, the Royal Hospital was changed into a school for the orphans of officers and men of the Royal Navy, and they added the word college to the name. For nearly a hundred years, it was co educational. But in 1868, the Board of Governors decided to make it boys only. Much more boring, don't you think? And it stayed that way right up until 1991. When the school became co educational again. Okay, and here we are at the school church. Do we have any musicians with us? You? Wonderful. What do you play? Piano and organ. Oh, you'll love it here. Our church has the largest organ in England, and we often have recording companies, the BBC, etc., coming here to record. And our staff and students are more than welcome to play it. In fact, there's a waiting list. It's very popular. In fact, the school is very well known for its choir and orchestra. I sing in the choir, and last summer we toured North America. Great fun. A healthy mind in a healthy body, as the Romans used to say. Which brings us to our gym and swimming pool. Both are open from six in the morning till eleven at night. Seven days a week. The gym has everything you need for aerobics, weight training, martial arts, basketball, gymnastics, and even an indoor running track. So there's no excuse for not keeping fit. And of course, we have all the usual team sports soccer, basketball. Our women's basketball team won the All England Universities Championship this year. Rugby, water polo, No American football. So you see, we are quite a sporty lot here. And we also study sometimes. Here's the main library. I'm afraid we can't go in because it's being redecorated. It's supposed to open again this Wednesday, but it looks to me that it'll be a bit late. And here's the coffee shop. Why don't we stop here for a drink? Agree? Jolly good. That is the end of section two. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You're going to hear a conversation between John and Anne, two students who are talking about their survey. Answer questions twenty one to twenty six first. You now have some time to read questions twenty one to twenty six. Hi, Anne. How's it going? Thank goodness I finished that survey on television watching and reading ability. What was your survey on? I told you before. I wanted to find out if there is any relationship between how fat students are and how many times they eat at fast food restaurants. That's right. I'd forgotten. Have you got your report finished? All the graphs and charts, that sort of thing. Almost done. What about you? All ready to present to the class, apart from one or two small things. Actually, my results are really interesting. Want me to tell you what I found? Sure, if you promise to let me tell you what I found. No problem. Anyway, look at this graph here. On the x axis, I have the dependent variable reading level. How did you measure reading level? I used the English department test, and on the y axis, I have a number of hours usually spent. Watching television every week. Thirteen to nineteen, twenty to twenty-nine, thirty to thirty-nine, forty to forty-nine, and fifty to fifty-nine. What are these numbers? The people's ages. I managed to get exactly twenty people from each age group to do the test. Took me ages. And what did you find out? 
Well, look at this. If we take the hundred people as one group, we see that the more television people watch, the worse their reading level. That's not surprising. But did you find any significant difference between the different age groups? You bet. Okay. This is the curve for the group as a whole. These lines are for the different age groups. See what I see? Wow, that's fascinating. The two youngest groups are very similar. Big difference between the oldest two groups and the youngest two. The older the people are, the less the correlation between reading level and hours spent in front of the TV. Why do you think that is? Well, I need to do more research before I can say for sure. But from talking to the people, it's clear that over the past thirty years, most people have been watching more television and reading fewer books. But the older people don't tell me. They spent more time reading when they were young than young people nowadays. So they learned to read well, and even though they spend more time in front of the TV than they used to, their reading levels stay the same. Hey, you're pretty smart. That's exactly what I think. But I need to do more research before I can say for sure. How about your survey? As the conversation continues, answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Nothing surprising. Well, actually, one thing is really interesting. Look, this is the number of times people usually go to a fast food place every week, and these are the percentages of people who are normal weight, overweight, or obese, meaning really, really fat. Look, no fast food. Only about five percent are obese, and look, twelve or more, about a third. And another graph, we have the number of hours they exercise every week. Wow, a big difference. More junk food, less exercise, more fat. I didn't think it would be so obvious. That's great work. Why do you think people who exercise more tend to eat less junk food? I asked everyone about that and found that people who care about their health do more exercise and eat fewer French fries and all that other greasy food, fast food stuff. Simple. That makes sense. But I see you found lots of people who eat the stuff more than once a day on average. I can't believe it. You'd be surprised. You're right. Hey, who's this guy? More than twelve a week? I bet it was Richard. He must weigh two hundred and sixty kilos, and he's pretty short, all fat, no muscle. You're right, and he drinks tons of soft drinks, all that sugar. Okay, that's it. Healthy food only from now on. And get to the gym, fatty. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You're going to hear a lecture on corporate crime. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Good evening. Welcome once again to Criminology Two O One. I'm happy to see you all looking so alert and full of energy after a busy day. Tonight and for the next few weeks, we will be looking at what is clearly a very important topic: corporate crime. First of all, what do we mean by corporate crime? The simple answer, of course, is crime committed by a corporation. 
usually by the heads of a corporation working together. But what about a crime committed by, for example, the CEO of a company, who without the knowledge of his colleagues, bribes a government official in order to get a big fat contract for his company? Well, we won't be looking at this kind of white-collar crime. Rather, we'll restrict our study to cases where the top people in a business entity work together and knowingly break the law, and especially those cases where, until they get caught, this type of unlawful behaviour is actually part of the corporate culture. First, why do they do it? The simple answer is to make more money. Well, most businessmen want to make more money, but they don't break the law to do so. So what factors make a group of men, yes, they are usually men, but women are by no means immune from this temptation, decide to step outside the law? In the next few weeks, we'll be looking into this question with a lot of case studies in some depth. We will also try to divide corporate crime into several categories and see what they share in common in terms of the psychology and organisational culture of those who commit them. And we will also look into the legal, social and political settings in which these crimes occur. A particularly interesting aspect of corporate crime is the process of detection, trial and punishment. It often seems that this type of crime goes on for an unreasonable length of time before it is detected by the authorities. Is this true, and if so, why? There is also a common perception that people found guilty of corporate crimes are treated much more leniently by the courts than, for example, your common everyday thief, or murderer even. Is this true, and if so, why? I mentioned that we will divide corporate crime into several categories and look at some specific cases. What categories can we think of? Well, one is that of product safety, where a company markets a product that it knows to be unsafe. One of the landmark cases in corporate criminology of this type is the Ford Pinto case. Ford was accused of rushing the production of an unsafe car, and in 1980 there was the criminal trial of the Ford Motor Company for reckless homicide. We'll look at the research on white-collar crime and studies on organisational culture and structure to examine the lack of safety and recall regulations that may have contributed to as many as 500 deaths. As one report put it, much of the literature on the Ford Pinto case focuses on how consumer safety was willingly sacrificed in the face of corporate greed. Another category of corporate crime is manipulation of a company's share prices. One form of this is insider trading. Closely related and sometimes very difficult to prove is a kind of creative accounting whereby, for example, profits are exaggerated in order to drive up a company's share prices. Take the Enron scandal. On November 29, 2001, the Wall Street Journal ran an article in which they reported that for years the company may have been President Bush's biggest financial backers, donating nearly $2 million to his campaigns. And it appeared that the Bush administration's national energy plan might have been in part an effort to help one of Bush's largest contributors. So we see politics creeping into this corporate crime question. That is the end of Section 4. You now have some time to check your answers.